Now many of you already heard about the death of Prince Nelson Rogers. He was a worldwide star and he died about a month ago from me recording this video. So I'm sure many of you are aware of it. It was headline news. Many were grieved about his death. Many conspiracy theories are out there in terms of why he died and so on. Now I don't normally do videos on famous stars and so on. I found the story pretty interesting. Now Prince speaks about how he grew up going to church often but he never really could get into church. He found the message to be quite fearful and he came from a broken home. There's many reports about that and it seems that because of these circumstances it led him to rebel against the faith, go out into the world and then he later turned Jehovah Witness. Now during his lifespan many times Prince did speak about him loving Jesus and believing in God. You see him speaking about this many times in his interview. I believe in God. There is only one God. And I believe in the afterworld and I just want people to know that I'm very sincere in my beliefs and I pray every night and I don't ask for much, I just say thank you. But I just want to say that actions speak louder than words and Prince's lifestyle, especially when he was young, promoted something that was totally against biblical principles and it's clear for everyone to see, not judging the man, not saying I'm better than the man, it's just the reality of the situation. That Prince, through his music, through his lifestyle, even through the way he dressed, he promoted all those things that God found abominable, abominable in the sight of the Lord, i.e. licentiousness, um, the fornication, um, dressing like a woman, God tells us that, that that's an abomination, he's totally against that. So the reality of the situation is that even though Prince said he believed in God, he loved Jesus, his actions showed that contrary to that and we are judged by our fruit, by their fruit we shall know someone. The Lord says many shall say Lord, Lord, you know, but only those that do his will will enter into the kingdom. So let's just, you know, accept the reality of that situation. And we also see this clearly in a song that Prince wrote, which was called Seven, which was based upon the revelation it was reported. And in this song called Seven, Prince speaks about the sevens dying, that all sevens we will watch them fall and he repeats that often. Now many believe that this seven he's referring to is Seventh Day Adventists and that he wants to see the destruction of Seventh Day Adventists because he had a negative back he had negative experience of the Seventh Day Adventist church due to his environment. So he speaks about them falling and in a particular stanza of that song, he speaks about an angel coming to him, giving him a key. And this angel is described as a female. And again, they are talking about, again, the sevens falling and so on. And bear in mind that there are good angels and that there are bad angels. And the angel that came to Prince can only be a bad angel, a satanic angel, because what he's promoting, or what she, he describes the angel as she, and in the Bible, there's no she angels. Nevertheless, this she angel that came to Prince, which can only be from Satan, talks about the sevens falling and so on. Conversation, the artist shared a very personal discovery he's recently made about himself. This is very interesting. Recent uh, analysis has proved that there's probably two people inside of me, mm -hmm. just like a Gemini. And we haven't determined what sex that other person is yet. Did you say, I'm not even sure what sex it is, or mm -hmm. he or she or it is? Did you say that? Yeah. I thought I heard that. What I'm getting from you is that you are very much in touch with both sides of yourself, your masculine and feminine mm -hmm. side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And always have been. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so people grow up thinking that you're weird or that you're gay because of it, and that never bothered you? Hey, <laughs> whatever floats the boat. <laughs> <laughs> whatever peanut butter is the jelly. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
It's in that uh, chart literally, like it. another personality you're talking about. Well, what the, they seemed to find was that it was some someone I had created when I was five years old. Really? Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I'm not sure yet, but I hope to find out. They, like psychologist, therapist? Well, actually, I found out uh -huh. because uh, I took some. I took someone through therapy. Uh huh. So. And you found out that yeah. there is another person. Yeah. Living inside you. This is turning into a civil interview. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Does that person have a name that we could call? That that's what's that's what is so interesting to me is that I um, I think that that's why I changed my name. I think that's who I am now. Really? I, I, yeah, I very much feel divorced from Prince. You really do? Yes. So it shows to us clearly, and I don't say this with any joy in my heart, that Prince, like many in the music industry, was just Satan's instrument. That's the reality of the situation. And the role of Satan, his game, what he wants more, is to destroy the remnant church, the remnant church that keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus because the Bible clearly tells us that in Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 where it tells us and the dragon was wroth, the dragon is Satan, Revelation 12 9 tells us and he is wroth with the woman, Revelation is written in symbolic language so the woman is the church, Jeremiah 6 2 would tell you that a woman represents a church in Bible prophecy, so the dragon Satan is angry with the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now note that this group whom Satan is warring against is the remnant. And the Seventh Adventists are always known as being a remnant in Christendom because we are the only ones who emphasize keeping the commandments of God through faith in Jesus, including the Seventh day Sabbath. And many believe that through that song, uh, Prince is working with the devil under the devil's influence to destroy Seventh-day Adventists. Now he can destroy Seventh-day Adventists not just physically but more so in the spiritual by through his music you know through the things of the world to get God's people to forsake the commandments of God and join the world. So he's basically working with the devil to destroy Seventh-day Adventists and it doesn't have to be physically we are in the spiritual realm and how the devil wants to destroy true Christians is through the allurements of the world the music the TV everything it promotes that's how Satan wants to get God's people so it's important that we are to be aware of that Alongside that, we are told that the whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seven Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honouring the institution of this anti-Christian power. So the whole world is going to be against Seven Adventists and Prince pledged his allegiance to join with the devil in regards to this. And it's important that we understand and recognize this. More clearly, we see Prince's association with the world and satanic principles is also through the symbol he promoted. Now, many of us are aware that Prince changed his name to the unpronounceable symbol, which was a symbol of male and female, the joining together. Um, he tells us this. The symbol came to you, and the symbol is like a combination of female and male? Yes. And that is why you're now... But this symbol which you see, which Prince so heavily promoted, can be stemmed to Egypt, to a symbol which many of the Egyptian gods and pharaohs carried, which is known as the Ankh. You can see the similarities, how they look the same that it's the same message that Prince was promoting. Now, this Ankh, as I mentioned, stems from Egypt. And many of you who have been following me on this channel will know that there's a theme running through it in regards to Egypt and God's people going back to Egypt spiritually when we are to come out of Egypt. And this Ankh symbol can be traced down to 
Egypt, a satanic organization, a satanic power, a satanic theocracy that was totally against God. We are told the Egyptian gods are often portrayed carrying it by its loop or bearing one in each hand, arms crossed over the chest. The unk appears in hand or in proximity of almost every deity in the Egyptian pantheon. So you can see that this was promoted by the Egyptian gods simply because they believed that it had power in it and that's why they heavily promoted it. You see that many pictures of the gods carrying this unk and they believed it was associated with power, with magic. And this should be no surprise to us Bible students because when Moses went to meet the Pharaoh in Egypt, it speaks of the magicians who were also trying to counteract the work of God. So we see this symbol really represents all that which belongs to Satan because the Egyptian power was in direct opposition to the principles of God's principles of Egypt, basically self-exaltation, exalting yourself above God. And the symbol of the Ankh, you know, stems from fertility, the woman uterus. And this is what many of the Egyptian Babylonian gods actively promoted. It was fertility, sun worship. And you can see that through the image of the Ankh. That's why Prince often referred to it as the love system, the union between man and woman. It all stems back to Egypt, which is the commencement of all that great apostasy, which is against God. Speaking more about the Ankh, we are told, the Ankh is pure feminine energy. Ankh is an ancient amulet wand that symbolizes life, creation and eternity. In Kamat, the queen mothers, sun gods and kings are shown carrying it in each hand or by its loop to demonstrate her command over nature, energy and the power over life and death. So there's key words I want to focus on in that statement and that's the queen mother, sun gods and kings. Very important. Again, Ankh is the two-dimensional slice of the three-dimensional immaculate conception of the queen mother's womb, pregnant with the egg of a crystal. Her sacred spear loop represents the pregnant fertile womb of mankind, which contains the developing fetus of the crest, her. So we see how it stems from what? The queen mother, the immaculate conception. These should be ringing bells in your mind because we know that this is where in Egypt, in the Babylonian kingdoms, this is where the mother son worship has been traced down. And it all stems from Nimrod, you will find. It all stems from that era. And in this image, you can see the mother son worship. And that is what the Ankh symbolizes. And where they believe that the queen mother, you know, is like, God, you know, and she had this immaculate conception by the sun to produce a son. And all this can be traced down to Nimrod. Many of us are aware of the story of Nimrod. In the Bible, Nimrod is described as a mighty hunter in the face of the Lord. Genesis 10, 8 to 9 tells us, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now Cush's father was Ham, and Ham is who established Egypt. So Nimrod's lineology traces down to Egypt. Nimrod is a product of Egypt. It continues, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Arak and Ach, and Kelanan in the land of Shinar. And Nimrod is known to have built the Tower of Babel. And what Nimrod was seeking to do was to set the whole world 
a new world order here was building. That's what the Tower of Babel represented if you studied it. A new world order that was totally against God. That's why the Bible describes him as a mighty hunter in the face of God. And it was through his lineology, the mother, son, worship was established. Now, why do I say that? Well, when Nimrod died, his wife Samaras claimed to have been pregnated by the son and she gave birth to a son, the son, the son, and she gave birth to a son. And that is what triggered the mother son worship, the unk, the power of the son is all intertwined. And that's where it all began. And Satan set up this system to confuse God's people because many times God's people were caught up offering sacrifices to the God of Moloch, offering their children. It stems through this false system that was established and God wants us to be aware of it and turn for it because the same principles are here today and many don't realise it. So Satan set up this counterfeit system to deceive God's people from the truth so that when Christ truly was to come, he was to be born of a virgin. Many will reject that, thinking that it's already taken place before or just be totally confused about the issue. So it's important that we recognise and understand that. Speaking more about this, A.T. Jones writes, the Egyptian records state that the first rulers of Egypt were the gods, after them the demigods, and after these the kings. In Egypt, however, the king was not content as in Assyria to call himself the viceroy of his god. He claimed to be the very embodiment of God itself. The god was personated in the king from him. It was declared the people received the breath of their nostrils. He was the giver of life. And thus, through Nimrod was the first man to establish monarchical authority and assume the kingly title and crown. Yet in Egypt, his example was followed to the greatest lengths, as Egypt was undoubtedly the most idolatrous nation that ever was on the earth. Their apostasy of every kind culminated so that through the Bible, the one word Egypt symbolises everything that is contrary to God. So it's important to understand what Egypt is and what it symbolised. It was a system set up to oppose the principles of God. And as it was in the beginning, as it was then, so it is now. There is a thing called spiritual Egypt that the Bible described. And it's the same principles embodied in spiritual Egypt. And that is self-exaltation, exalting yourself against God getting caught up in the false worship of idols. You see the imagery today. It's the same thing happening in the spiritual sense that God wants us to be aware of, but many sadly are not. Now, when we go back to the times of Nimrod, when he established this Babel kingdom, the majority of the whole world was in direct opposition against God. The whole world basically was against God, as we see today, imbued with the principles of Egypt, self-exaltation. Yet, upon this earth, God must have a remnant. There must be a few that will hold fast to the commandments of God. And the remnant that was faithful, that was against idolatrous worship during that time, was Abraham. And that's why the Lord called Abraham out of Shinar and gave him the promise, a remnant, just how God is calling us out of Shinar, Babylon, today. In Genesis 12, 1, we are told, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, out from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So God is telling Abraham to get out of that idolatrous nation. And when he does that, he will show him the land that he plans to give him. Speaking about this land, we are told, and the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated, so he's now separate from his kingdom, he tells him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. 
So God tells Abraham clearly that, that he's going to give him a land to him and his seed. And this land is forever. But did God give Abraham that land? Note what Stephen says, speaking about this in the book of Acts chapter 7, begin that verse 2. So Stephen says, Men, brethren and fathers, hearken. The glory of the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dealt in Sharam. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much to set his foot on, yet he promised that he will give it to him for a possession and to his seed when he as yet he had no child. Now that's interesting because God tells Abraham he's going to give him a land, he gives him a promise, but yet, and this land is going to be forever to him, bear that in mind. But yet, Stephen, hundreds of years later, speaking, says, God didn't give him the land. So what does that make God a liar? No, as the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. The land which God promised to Abraham and his descendants is not this earth, so to speak, but it's the new earth. It's the new heavens you'll find. In Romans chapter 4 verse 13 we are told, For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So Abraham was to be heir of the world. And that world is the new heaven and the new earth. Again, in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 to 16 we are told, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have, out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So they were strangers, they were pilgrims upon this earth. This world was not their home. Why? Because they looked for a better city whose maker was God. And this city is the new Jerusalem, because in Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 we are told, and John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 verse 2. Now why am I going through all this? It's simply because I want you to recognise that this world is not our own. We are in spiritual Egypt. Because the principles of Egypt, self-exaltation is embodied in the world today self-exaltation the world which is totally in enmity against God and his principles so as God called Abraham out of Mesopotamia Babylon and gave him the promise to him and his seed. Likewise, he's doing the same to us. He's calling us out of this idolatrous worship that's taking place all over us, calling us to be a peculiar people and bringing him, bringing us to himself. That's what we need to understand. This world is not our home. It speaks of the money, the cars and everything, but it's temporary. I mean, look at Prince, for instance, he had everything it may seem but you look into his eyes and you can see he was miserable he was a slave he was in bondage he was a spiritual egyptian that's the reality of the situation and look at him now he's dead that's the end sadly 
gone. You know? Would he be in heaven? I don't know if he repented the last days of his life. I don't know. Only God knows. But I want us to understand that these things on this earth is temporal. And like Abraham, we should be seeking to get out of Babylon and keep our minds focused on the spiritual, the new heavens, because we are pilgrims. Now, the story of Prince sort of reminds me of Solomon. We know that Solomon, you know, was a Jew. You know, he had everything. He was blessed from God. But what happened? He turned away from God. How did he turn away from God? What led to his downfall? It was when he took an Egyptian wife. That's no coincidence. And then he totally turned against God and began to worship their gods. He's known to put his kids through the fire. All that was abominable to God. We see Solomon being caught up in it just as prince was caught up in it but in his later years praise God we know that Solomon repented and he describes all those things that he had he had the world the richest man that lived at that time he calls it vanity it was miserable he was miserable and I want you to understand that many of those stars that may look up to today he want to be like they are the most miserable people upon the earth and you can see it in their eyes they are in bondage they are a slave it's all an illusion and we need to wake up and not be deceived Solomon recognized this and note what he writes describing his experience he says I made me great works I built me houses I planted me vineyards I made me gardens and orchards I got me servants and maidens I gave me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the promises I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the son of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. So he's basically telling us that he had everything. He continues. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy and my heart rejoiced in all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun so what was it it was vanity it was worthless he continues and i turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly for what can the man do that cometh after the king even that which hath been already done I hated life, yeah, I hated all my labour which I had taken under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 4 to 18. So we see Solomon had everything, but what did it result? Him hating life. It was worthless, he recognised. And so I want you to understand the things of this earth, they're worthless. They don't make you happy and you see it in the stars and I believe Prince was a victim of it and my heart goes out to these men because it's so sad to see to live a life of bondage and to hate the world yet seeming to have everything but in reality having nothing at all speaking more about Solomon we are told by his own bitter experience Solomon learned the emptiness of life that seeks in earthly things its highest good he erected altars to heathen gods only to learn how vain is their promise of rest of the spirit gloomy and soul harassing faults troubled him night and day for him there was no longer any joy of life or peace of mind and the future was dark with despair that's a horrible way to live to be in bondage you know but praise god you know with the story of solomon we see hope because solomon repented 
he turned away from the evil and he went back to God and God accepted him. Sadly, he left a negative influence, you know, he sowed a lot of negative seed, you know, which is still going on today through Israel. You know, the seed has been sown because there's consequences to our actions. When we sin, it doesn't just affect ourselves, it affects others. Nevertheless, Solomon did repent and God accepted him. And I want to say to anyone out there who feels despair, who's feeling lost, who have gone out to the world, not to despair. If you turn to Christ right now, he will accept you. Don't listen to what the devil says. The only way you can sin away your day of grace is if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you would no longer feel the conviction about coming to God. The fact that you may feel convicted right now show that the Holy Spirit is working with you and all you have to do is turn, forsake, confess, repent from your sins and God will accept you. We are told, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his faults and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You know, because I know there's many people who say that, oh, they sold their soul to the devil, you know, there's no coming back, there's no hope and so on. When that's not necessarily the case, many of them have been deceived into this. God's arms are always stretched out for the sincere who want to come to him. And he welcomes them with open arms. We see this in the parable of the son, you know, who went out to the well to squander his earnings, lived a life of sin, partying, reveling. But then when he realized he had nothing, he went back to the father. And did the father turn him away? No, he accepted him. And that's an illustration of our father in heaven. Many times we portray God, you know, um, our father as being someone who's like so unforgiving, you know. But God is love, true love, self-sacrificing love. And it's not willed that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are told, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Psalms 32, 5. And this is what David wrote. What did David do? He killed the man so he can have his wife. What wickedness is that? But yet he repented. And David is described as a man after God's heart. Even Manasseh, who's known to kill many of the prophets, who worshipped Baal and Moloch, when he repented, God accepted him. So we have time to repent. Don't leave it too late. Don't wait, because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's so important that we forsake our sins and go back to the Lord. We are told in Isaiah 27 verse 5, or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Amazing. Again, great peace have there which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. The law is God's hedge of protection around us. And many of us did the law as bondage, as evil, when no, it is the only way for peace. I mean, look at the principles of God's law. Do not steal, do not lie, do not commit adultery, honour your father and mother. It's all for our protection. And when we break those laws and we go out to the world, that's when there's no safety. I was in the world, you know, lived a life of sin, but as I've come to learn about God and the Bible and the commandments and the Sabbath, I have never felt so safe in my life. Just that security. Because when you're obedient to God's commandments, you have his seal, he protects you, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Even if they try to kill the flesh, if you're in God, your mind is at peace. That's why when they're trying to kill um, the saints of old, many of the martyrs, they were singing as they're going to their grave. Why? 
because like their father Abraham, their minds were focused on the heavenly, the new Jerusalem, the new city which God has prepared for us because they recognize that they are pilgrims. We are pilgrims, so it's foolish for us to seek the things of this world and try to make a name for ourselves and try to, you know, have all this money and all these large houses and that doesn't make you happy. It never will. True peace comes from being obedient to the law. True peace comes from self-sacrifice, living a life of service, going out to help people, putting other people first. That is peace, that is joy. And not that self-seeking pledge which we see to the world, which comes from Egypt, Babylon. That's death. And we see that in many of the stars today. They live a miserable life and they die early. Let us not be deceived. This world is not our home. To conclude, we are told, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And that comes from the words of Solomon. He recognized this. Keep God's commandments and you'll be safe from the wiles of the devil.